I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak to you today on this topic, on the role that civil society can play in preventing genocide and mass atrocities. It's a pretty daunting topic, you know, when you begin to talk about genocide and uh, mass uh, atrocities. I'm aware that of the fact that in the ears of some, uh, it's a pretty, um, to speak of civil society in the same breath as an actor in the prevention of, uh, of mass instances of large-scale violence, that might sound rather presumptuous. However, I do think, and uh, as you hear a little bit of my background, one reason I've really uh, devoted much of my career to working with civil society organizations, I do believe that there's quite a bit that individuals and social institutions, social organizations can do to advance stability, peace, and the respect of human rights in their countries. So I'm very pleased to be here. I'm not an academician nor a politician. I'm a humble practitioner. <laughs> and so hopefully this will bring another uh, perspective to what, um, what you'll be hearing uh, in your studies and also um, uh, today's topic. I suppose that one major reason that some find it difficult to conceive of a constructive role for civil society in such situations is the way that we have framed our thinking around um, genocide and uh, mass violations of human rights. We tend to limit our thinking to only victims and perpetrators. And these are the primary actors in a conflict, or so we think. And so any meaningful intervention we began to think comes from the outside and not within uh, society itself. And if we begin to think in terms of uh, fragile states or failed states, by implication, there's something in the back of our minds to begin to think of uh, if the state has failed, when in some way that society has failed, there's something defective there, and that a society lacks the competence to address a major conflict, there's something wrong. Why trust minor actors in, uh, in conflicts in a society? And so we've typically brought uh, actors in from the outside, believing that uh, external experts are better to deal with a serious conflict than the people themselves. We may try international diplomacy or solicit the intercession of professional negotiators to broker some sort of agreement. And if that fails, we may try to, to uh, impose political or economic sanctions or even resort to armed intervention. These are actions that governments and particularly intergovernmental organizations have taken in response to a crisis. These are institutional responses to a crisis. And this is the stuff of newspaper headlines and political journals. This is something that we do and that we're all very familiar with. But what sort of actions can civil society take? What about internal solutions to mass violence? Aside from just being victims or mix, mere spectators to events and forces seemingly beyond their control, how have people organized themselves to prevent the worst from happening? What about the power of normal citizens to affect change in their communities and in the wider society? It is this citizen power to affect change that is often disregarded in the political discourse over genocide and mass atrocities. So it's important for us to broaden our thinking and our understanding of human dynamics and human conflict by moving away from an exclusively institutional approach to conflict and toward an acknowledgement of the capacities that are already present for making and building peace in any given society. It means understanding the complex relationships that are at the root of human conflict. The dynamism of human interaction that shape and transform relationships it also means that we need to understand that politics are not just something that institutions do, but it's also something that occurs when people get together and organize themselves to affect change, and particularly change in conflictual relationships. It also means then that we need to broaden our understanding to realize that civil society can complement and even re-energize an institutional peace process and the complementarity of civil society action is an important point. This is not an anti-institutional speech. It's really saying that civil society has a very important role to play to complement and to energize uh, in partnership 
with institutions. So we're talking about widening the public space in which people work to affect change, not only through institutions, but also in those in-between places, the personal and social relationships that we all navigate in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's often in this space that real change occurs, and it's most effectively brought about. This is the soft power, or the smart power, that Joseph Nye talks about, the power that comes with the exchange of ideas and cultural values that is critical to cultural diplomacy and to the promotion of peaceful and stable relations in the world today. And this soft power is becoming an increasingly important feature of international and intercommunal relations in today's very interdependent world. In today's world, global public opinion is shaped to a remarkable degree by new technologies of communication. It's also shaped by real exchanges that are taking place between peoples and cultures that would have been unimaginable just two generations ago. And this exchange of information and cultural, intercultural context is becoming more and more important in the 21st century. And the relational aspects of soft power are something which civil society is well placed to deliver because civil society is about people and it's their particular role in playing, uh, they play in building, the civil society plays in building relationships, preventing violence in society, and securing their own future. And it is true that hard power, coercive force, if you will, will remain necessary in many situations, but there is a growing body of literature that's raising questions about some of the long-held and cherished assumptions that we have regarding the use of hard power to resolve human conflicts. And it's true that our recent history over the past hundred years, which is just a blip on the screen of history, our recent history has amply demonstrated the, de the limitations of hard power, typically the domain of governments and international institutions. There are limitations to adequately address deep-rooted conflicts. And this is where the question of prevention is all the more important. We're seeing that many conflicts simply cannot be addressed by a quick fix of coercive power and do not just go away that easily. We could name a number of conflicts that continue to brew on and on. In fact, we've seen that armed interventions can often make things worse. But there are, in fact, several ways that civil society is already actively participating in the prevention of genocide and mass atrocities. For instance, just to begin, uh, many civil society organizations work to collect data and do risk assessment, assessment and early warning. These are people that are well placed on the ground to give act adequate and um, reliable information. Civil society works quite a bit in awareness raising, the memorialization of genocide, as you will see done in many um, countries, post-genocidal countries. Rwanda in particular has done a very adequate, could do a better job at a political level, but has done a very um, thorough job of memorializing the tragedies of 1994 and dealing with the past. Civic education and citizen empowerment is also a very important role of civil society. This has to do with democracy building and constructing over time a culture of human rights and nonviolence. This is something to which civil society is particularly apt in doing and is absolutely necessary for breaking the cycles of violence that exist in many countries. This past week I met with representatives of a Jerusalem-based organization called Kids for Peace, if some of you are aware of that. It's a civil society organization that works with Jewish, Christian, and Muslim children and their families in a highly segregated and volatile environment. And they learn the beliefs, and values, and culture of the other in a safe space. And in, it's in this people-to-people -people encounter of this sort that understanding takes root and incidents of violence are often mitigated. And this is an ex excellent example of soft power at its best. Of course, civil society also has a role to play in advocacy and the creation of political will because it's the lack of political will to combat exclusionary ideologies 
that can lay the groundwork for killings and genocide to take place. Genocide does not occur overnight. It just doesn't show up the next day. It is a collective, planned, and organized phenomenon which requires a certain environment in which to operate. And governments, of course, can have a decisive role either in facilitating such an environment or in taking measures to mitigate the conditions in which genocide can occur. This is the question of political will, and this is often the work of a vibrant and independent civil society by interfacing with decision makers and power holders and creating that political will to safeguard the well-being and best interests of the people. Also, many civil society organizations, and I'll give you an, uh, an example of this in a few moments, work at community-based mediation of conflicts, and they also work, of course, the capacity building for social change. And there are many, many notable projects underway that, in fact, do take up this work, and it's important to begin this discussion by recognizing that. And, uh, and I do here want to reference um, the International Coalition for the Responsibility to Protect one clearinghouse of information and methodologies and toolkits that certainly merit your attention. So I invite you to visit their, their website and see what they have on offer on this topic. But in any case, it is necessary to take a multidisciplinary approach if we are to successfully confront the possibilities of mass killings and genocide. This includes not only methods that we have in the West that we typically associate with violence prevention, but also customary practices that have been present in traditional cultures for many years. These can also be accessed in particular contexts to, to, uh, to thwart rising of incidences of genocide. However, what I've chosen to do in this presentation, I'm aware of the constraints of time, so I'll try to respect that, is to highlight one initiative of a more grassroots nature which illustrates a community-based response to conflict through mediation and conflict resolution in a way that reduces the risk of mass killings and human rights violations. And for this discussion, I must reference um, uh, somebody for whom I have um, deep respect, and I'm deeply indebted to the theoretical framework that has been elaborated by uh, Dr. Harold Saunders, the former security advisor to the White House and State Department official. And Mr. Saunders was heavily involved in U.S. diplomacy efforts in the Middle East in the 1970s and later on with former Soviet states after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Yet throughout his experience in the field of formal mediation, and negotiations, working institutionally, if you will, he observed that many of these interventions were taking place without sufficiently considering the relational dynamics that existed on the ground that were already present in those conflicts. And at the same time, he saw the importance of these underlying relational connections, the importance of informed and intentional interaction between civil society actors for strengthening the peace process and for achieving a sustainable peace. And so Harold Saunders developed a different sort of approach to resolving conflicts, one that makes use of the proximity of the embeddedness, the proximity and the embeddedness of civil society to affect change. And it focuses on the underlying relationships that cause conflict and not just on the conflicts themselves. And this approach he has called sustained dialogue. And what I'd like to do is briefly outline the practice of sustained dialogue, then I'll give you a concrete example of how this works in an intercommunal conflict in Liberia, uh, one that I was personally involved in, uh, at this process at a community level. I know somebody's from Zimbabwe. This has also been used in Zimbabwe, also used in, um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, at a different level. And, um, We'll talk about that if we have time, but, but first of all, sustained dialogue, it is a structure, uh, structured and interactive process designed to change conflictual relationships over time. What is often said in the sustained dialogue community is it takes you a long time to get into where you got yourselves. It's going to take a little bit of time to get yourself out. So no uh, quick fixes there. In this way, 
It is different from formal mediation and policy discussions, where sometimes people fly in and try to make peace over a weekend. It's a highly relational process that involves a lot of different actors at a very localized level. It involves the establishment of a dialogue group, which, which is composed of about 12 to 15 people in the beginning that are representatives of the community that are in conflict, communities that are in conflict. And these people agree to meet together over a fixed period of time, often for one or two or three years, to intentionally work at community relationships. Uh, the purpose is to structure regular and systematic contact with the other community such that this experience of changing relationships can provide a model and a stimulus for changing relationships in the wider community. So I'll tell you a little bit how this looks concretely. In 2009, I was involved in setting up and organizing and accompanying a sustained dialogue in Lofa County in northern Liberia in West Africa, where there's considerable tension between two dominant communities, the Mandingo, who are mostly Muslim and um, traders, commerçant, traders, and, uh, and also between the Lorma, who are agriculturalists, who are for the most part Christian or adhere to uh, traditional religions. And uh, part of the conflict between them is a bit of a quasi-religious um, conflict, although I'm quick to say most religious conflicts are not very religious. They're, they have other, the religion is sort of the, is sort of the, uh, the crust of it, you know. It's a lot more beneath that than, um, than uh, but, but, but it's often raised as one of the main differences between these two communities. And so we began to set up this process and to assist in structuring the sustained dialogue. I worked very closely with a civil society organization called Danel the Development Education Network of Liberia. That is a homegrown, very reputable organization in that part of Liberia. The sustained dialogue process is structured in five distinct stages. And here I'll run through the stages rather quickly, given our time constraints. Uh, but maybe if you have questions about uh, certain ones, we can talk about that lady, later. The first, um, the first is to decide to change and to engage. It's the formation of a dialogue group. And sometimes this is the, the longest stage of them all because sometimes it takes a little bit of time to convince everybody that this is a good thing. And uh, so if you can picture me sitting on the edge of a log talking to village elders in northern Liberia and trying to, to talk to them about explaining the process and why it's important for them and their communities to be involved in this, and you have a little bit of a picture of what, uh, what this took to do. And it takes a long time to do that. But it's very, very important. And until you have all the actors together agreeing that this is a way to go forward, we won't begin this dialogue at all. Also, at this stage, uh, Danelle recruited and trained two moderators of the process. I was not one of the moderators. I was one of the trainers of the moderators. And uh, we were uh, fortunate to have two very skilled um, already in group dynamics and, uh, and in conflict resolution, a Mandingo woman and a Lorma man who teamed up to be moderators of this diverse dialogue group. Uh, so after you finally decide to engage and form that, the first thing you do after you, you get together in your first meeting of the dialogue group is to map the problems. And to, under, and to understand the underlying relationships that are there. A lot of this has to do with storytelling. And we use a lot of storytelling to unpack a little bit of what the conflict is about. Because oftentimes, a conflicting group has never heard the story of when Charles Taylor came through their village and exploited Mandingo to kill Lorma, and they killed people in their family, sometimes wiped out their whole family, they never heard somebody talk about that before from the other side. There's these barriers, these barriers that exist between people that sometimes storytelling and, and talking about what happened can really help to bring people together. Uh, after we map the problems and the underlying relationships there, it's time to probe specific problems. This is where we begin to focus on setting priorities uh, that can bring us toward joint actions. 
And uh, by this time, of course, the dialogue group has been talking with each other, most probably for some months, and they understand where each other is coming from and what is workable for them to move forward. Uh, and they choose a direction for change. And of course, choosing that direction is very, very important before they can move forward. After that, they designed a scenario of interacting steps to change their relationships. Sometimes this means working on a particular pro problem together. Oftentimes it means looking at their relationships deeper and visiting with them much, and, uh, narrowing the gap between their communities. And they talked a lot about that. And then finally, of course, the fifth step would be to put this scenario into action. Uh, this is not always an easy and predictable um, uh, process. In fact, if there are some lessons learned, uh, one is that the, flat, the steps are very fluid. Uh, these are not rigid steps. In fact, the process itself is anything but neat and orderly. And uh, by delineating a process, though, of, from the beginning, that lays out a structure for moving forward, you see. And from the first session, we talk about these steps and where we're headed. Um, it could be that a group successfully passes from stage one to stage two and it's, thinks it's ready to move on to tackle more specific issues in stage three. But then something happens within the group, of course, that raises the need to go back to mapping the problem and understanding, again, the relational links in that problem. The group may even need to go back to stage one and decide whether they want to go on and continue to, to do this or not, engaging in this process. Uh, here, the choice of moderators is, is really crucial. I talked a little bit about um, uh, the two moderators that we recruited. It's very important because they are the ones who accompany and steer the process from a professional level. We provided training, and I was somewhat their coach, and talked to them. But recruiting the actual dialogue group and the, and the moderators from the beginning is very important. The dialogue group itself, by the way, was composed of a very diverse group. I think we had, um, we had 14 in this group, equally of uh, Mandingo and Lorma. They were drawn from several villages in the target area that we were uh, looking at. These were village leaders and simple laborers, young and old, men and women. Uh, the one thing that they did hold in common, of course, was a desire to change the relationships within their communities and to avoid further bloodshed, because they were headed toward further bloodshed. Um, another important lesson learned is uh, assessing transition points is very, very important. As I was saying, before moving on to another, another place, it's important to know uh, whether there's readiness that exists within the group, and if not, to backtrack or to move them forward or to move to one side or the other to get where you want. Uh, the group met together for over a two-year period, this particular group, and they set their own pace and they decided for themselves the future of the dialogue and where it was headed. The results, though, were really impressive. Um, I could talk long and uh, long about um, what we saw as a real result. You know, in peace work and conflict relationship, it's very hard to quantify results. You know, a lot of donors want you to say exactly what happened and put numbers to it. It's very hard to do that. But often it's the anecdotal things that rise out of this experience. It's really important. Um, we saw the tensions were eased and community relations improved markedly. And incidents of crime within that target area just plummeted, in fact. And uh, several intercommunal projects were organized, such as sports events. I was very interested uh, earlier to hear about sport diplomacy. This was done after there was more understanding that was uh, developed but between them. But th there were Lorma and Mandingo um, uh, sports teams and also mixed teams, which we pushed for, <laughs> to have mixed uh, Lorma Mandingo and mixed Lorma Mandingo uh, uh, to be able to, to join together in um, in, uh, also in soccer. Um, and uh, well, one just, uh, and there were also uh, joint efforts to improve the roads and other infrastructural developments in the area. Uh, I'll just give one quick um, uh, anecdote too. Several months into the project, the dialogue group was being hosted in a, in a Lorma village. And the meeting ran a little bit uh, longer than expected, a little bit like today. <laughs> and it came about that the Mandingos 
uh, came to the time when they would do their evening prayer. However, they, were, they had not brought their prayer mats with them because they thought they'd be home by, by this time. Now, before the beginning of this sustained dialogue, there would have been no assistance offered to accommodate the other group's cultural or religious practices. But this time, the village elder instructed some youths to go out into the forest and cut banana leaves. You know, they're very big banana leaves to go and to bring them back for prayer mats, make prayer mats for their Muslim guests. Now, this incident, you might think, well, that's, that's very nice, but it's when these are insights into changed relationships. This incident, among, along with many other stories, was indicative of improved relationships and mutual respect between the Mendingo and Lorma communities. This is what civil society can do not politicians from the capital or internal actors, I mean external actors or international <coughs> NGOs. This is what the people themselves do. Uh, but at the same time, there is an interface with decision makers. These changes in Lofa County attracted national attention. It was on Liberian television. It drew the support of several political leaders and requests for similar dialogue processes to be set up in other parts of the country and other parts of Africa as well. Um, and finally, uh, just to give you a summary, uh, which if you get these notes, you will get them. The summary of what I just said is that states, governments, and institutions do play a crucial role in the prevention of genocide and mass atrocities. However, they are limited in their ability to access the soft power that's necessary to change, to do deep change in societies. And we must broaden our understanding of human conflict to understand the complex relationships that give rise to mass violence. And an independent and engaged civil society is best situated to promote and organize the interactions that are essential to shaping and transforming conflictual relationships. And groups of citizens that commit to a systematic and interactive process of sustained dialogue can change conflictual relationships over time. And as the groups experience change in relationships and design future actions, and this is what we want out of this whole process, of course, they become a bit of a laboratory for change in their respective communities. And the deep work of reconciling strained relationships and affecting societal change are the strongest preventative for genocide and mass atrocities. This is often the work of civil society that can complement an institutional peace process. They're not to be opposed one from the other. We can work together and build a more peaceful, um, more peaceful world together. Thank you for your attention. Sorry for going through this. Uh, there's much, much more that could be said about this process. Do be in touch if you'd like to uh, have more information. Thank you.